good evening everyone it's a pleasure to be here what i will talk about is how do you take an entire vertical like fleet management ola uber and how do you apply ai end to end right what are the different ways of thinking about uh, how ai is is used in a vertical so this is like a case study right and it's a case study a personal case study that i have gone through in one year at ola and i'll talk about how i figured out this domain so when i was joining ola i had no idea what is there in fleet management why would ola even need a data scientist right and by the time it was one year i was amazed at the amount of data science that can be done in fleet management right so this is kind of a summary of all that and a lot of my learnings uh, that happened during the later part of my career was in ola so it's, it's one of my favorite places that i worked at and i learned a lot about data science there right so some of the wisdom that i'll share with you today is that practical wisdom on working on a very complicated problem so you know i'll help you understand why this is a complicated problem and more importantly right so this talk is at three levels simultaneously one is this talk is about a domain like fleet management and how to apply you know ai in the fleet management domain second this talk is about you know what a true skill of data science is right it is is it just ability to manage data or high volume or visualization or building models or is there something else to it right so you learn that there is something else beyond the tools and the magic of the of the python and all of that there's something else to data science which has to come out in this talk and hopefully you will learn that and third is you will learn how to think top down and bottom up simultaneously right which is very important and some of you are very senior people some of you are middle and some of you are very junior so we all think differently but combining top down thinking and bottom up thinking is a very important skill set in building a complicated uh, architecture of ai for a company like ola right so we will talk about that kind of a thing yeah All right. So when I joined Ola, you know there was a company called uh, there's a company called Chai Point, and they had a very nice tagline that says India runs on chai. You know, and when I looked at that, I was uh, very intrigued by that, and I said, let's come up with a theme for the team that I will lead. And I said, Ola runs on AI, right? So that was the theme that I came up with, and uh, you know, so I I just stuck with that, and basically I talk about AI in fleet management. All right. All right. So let's start, and uh, I want to first. Uh, you know help you understand why this is a difficult problem statement why is it difficult compared to you know google search or netflix recommendations or or retail you know amazon recommendations and all that why is fleet management a far more complex problem than each of these individual problems right first i want you to understand that then we'll talk about the art of formulation which is how do we formulate such a complex problem into many many different machine learning models and how these models talk to each other to kind of solve the whole problem yeah all right so uh, all right so um, so basically you know at the at the early time of uh, this term that was created right data scientist right dj patel one of the ex chief data scientist at uh, at the white house obama administration he coined the term uh, uh data scientist right and they were looking for a term to describe what these people do and he was at linkedin at the time and you know he kind of uh, tried to figure out a terminology to describe what people do in this domain and he called it data scientist and that sort of stuck and then it came up and he wrote a very nice article about this and he said you know this is the sexiest job in the 21st century and all of that and you know he just kind of uh, evangelized the whole thing now i took this to the next level when i worked at ola i said fleet management is the sexiest problem in data science and this is what i will talk about which is uh, you know we all love to build computer vision models and speech models and nlp models and supervised and supervised learning but when i look at ai i don't see it as a collection of models i see it as a as a domain as a vertical right telecom vertical fleet management agriculture healthcare so these are different verticals where you can apply data science and this talk is a very deep uh, journey of how we did that and once you understand this at whatever level of abstraction you'll be able to understand ai from a different perspective right that is the whole so let's talk about 
why I call fleet management the sexiest problem in data science, right? So let me give you three contexts for it. So if you look at Google search, right? What happens in Google search when you search for a web page, the web page is still there on the internet available for others also to search, right? And get it on their uh, browsers. It does not disappear because one person is looking at it. It doesn't disappear from the system. So Google is on the internet and it is like that. But when it comes to Ola Uber, if you book a cab, right, it disappears from the system and it appears again back when it is released, right? So this is one of the properties of a fleet management system that it is a resource constrained system. Internet search, you know, all the virtual systems, right? Whether it is Facebook and all that or Netflix, you know, it's not like one person is watching a movie so others cannot, right? It's an infinite resource system, a virtual system, right? Digital, purely digital system. But a digital physical system like Ola Uber is a resource constraint system, right? So that's an important property of the system you have to understand. The second example of why is it such a unique problem is if I compare it to Amazon, right? So imagine if you buy a product at Amazon, the product by itself cannot say, I don't want to go to this customer, right? Product has no say in that. But if you think of a ride as a product, and if you think of a driver that can decide to cancel a ride, right? So what happens is then it's a two, this is what we call a two-sided marketplace. That means on one side, you have a provider, which is a driver. One side, you have a customer and it's a two-sided marketplace. Both are equally uh, likely to cancel or you know, uh, book book the this thing, right? So, so we understand that it's very different from retail, right? So, again, fleet management is a resource constrained, two sided marketplace. So, two properties that make it very different uh, than these two systems. Another comparison I'll do is when you talk to a doctor on Practo or wherever, you know, after you're done, the doctor is still at the same location. He does not appear somewhere else, right? But in the Ola Uber world, once you're done with the cab ride, you start it somewhere, it ends up somewhere else, right? So the resource that you're using, right? Driver versus a, a, you know, or a cab versus a doctor, the resource that you are consuming is very dynamic, right? It can move around. A cab is moving around 100,000 cabs in a city. They can be anywhere, right? So the idea that, you know, how do you manage a two-sided resource constrained, highly dynamic, you know, multi-agent uh, system like Ola Uber is a very complicated machine learning problem. Yeah. So now we'll talk about how, how kind of I went through this journey of learning about a new domain. So before this domain, I had worked on many other domains, finance, retail, insurance, uh, search engines and all of that, but I never worked on this. So when this opportunity came, I said, I have no idea, but that is good enough reason for me to jump into it and give it a shot. Right. So what I did is, um, by this time I had learned that, you know, data science is not about data. Data science is not about data. It is really about formulating a business problem into a machine learning architecture. So my role as a data scientist now is the top down thinking of what are all the things happening in a company, in a vertical. Right? whether it's fleet management, now I'm working on telecom, retail, re refinery and all that. How do you architect the entire AI architecture of that domain? Right? What does that mean? So that is what the thesis of this, uh, this thing is. Yeah? So what we'll do is, so when I went to Ola, I, I started looking at, uh, uh, you know, I started talking to all the product managers. I did not talk to the data scientist at Ola at all. I did not ask even one question about Tell me what the data sets we have. What do you do today? I did not talk about that. For the first week, I only talked about uh, the pain points. I talked to the different business leaders or vertical product heads, you know, people who do allocation of cabs at Ola, what policies they use, people who do pricing at Ola, people who do routing and cab movements, people who generate incentives and offers and, you know, do mixing of cabs, right? A prime ride can become a mini ride. All those people, I talked to each one of them and I tried to understand their points and they each one said, if you can solve my problem, you can solve Ola problem because, you know, everybody thinks that their problem is the main problem to be solved, right? 
so they were all solving their problems uh, very nicely with all the you know uh, software skills they had and analytical skills they had and and uh, you know excel skills they had uh, they had well defined metrics and all of that they were doing but somehow it was not working out you know and they would say that look uh, yesterday when i did this my profit went up but today my profit did not go up because and i did the same thing and i don't understand why right and that becomes a very difficult situation and similarly the other guy said i did this my metrics are moving up but sometimes they are moving down and i don't right then i talked to the cto the coo of ola and i said you know this is what i have learned in the last one week i've talked to all your or your product heads and all that and they all seem to be doing the right thing but there is something missing in all of them which is they are all solving the problem of their own silos the pricing guy is only focused on pricing the allocation guy is only focused on allocation incentives and offers people don't talk to each other one guy is giving more incentives to drivers but at the same time nobody is giving incentives to the customer so you have more supply and less demand right and unless you see this as a common single problem you are not going to solve ola as a fleet management system you are going to solve individual problems but not the whole and that turned me around and said wow this is an amazing problem to solve and that's when i jumped into ola as a full time employee right so now uh, the, the, we all have heard this right the whole is greater than the sum of the parts this is exactly what is true here in the ola world right now let me compare it back to google right so imagine these boxes are from google what will these boxes look like so one will say it's a gmail or a youtube or a ad system or a search engine right or a crawling you know crawling system or whatever right so these will be different systems they will have their own metrics they can all work independently because you know spam detection on on in you know on your gmail and youtube recommendation these are not connected models they don't interfere with each other you can work on them independently right the data silos are okay the modeling silos are okay the deployment silos are okay everything is okay there right because these models don't connect with each other so google is actually a collection of models not an ecosystem of models there's a big difference i have a laundry list of models they don't talk to each other they don't interfere with each other that's a collection of models but when i look at these models they are all connected it's not a single collection of models it's a uh, it's an ecosystem of models right so what i realized was that fleet management is not a collection of different levers right do this allocate this increase the price here these are different actions you can do and different metrics you can track it's not a collection of independent actions and independent metrics and ola cannot be modeled like that it has to be modeled as a single optimization problem and that was the key turning point for how we started thinking about ai in, in the fleet management right now this is what i want us to understand that there's a large class of problems out there which could be modeled as a single optimization problem like this so let's talk about what that is right so this is how we started formulating ola as a as a overall problem right so so after talking to all these people i you know i thought about it thought about it you know i wrote it this way that way and then i realized it's a very simple problem to solve so what is that right so if i look at uh, ola as a supply demand matching problem right so essentially what is happening you have locations and time so you can divide a city into small grids and you can divide time into small chunks of time right 5 minute windows 15 minute windows whatever you want and now in that time and location window right uh, as a as a joint like 9 am in this area versus 9 pm in this area are two different units right so if you take one of them all of them in the city essentially what you are trying to solve is a supply demand equality problem you are trying to match supply with demand and what you are saying is that look if my demand is more than supply right so if the number of cabs in an area at a given 15 minute window is more than supply demand is more than supply then some customers are not going to get cabs and ola is not going to get the revenue if supply is more than demand if there are more cabs and less customers then what will happen the cabs are sitting idle right and we are losing money 
and they are not being utilized where they could have been utilized. Right? So essentially, Ola is not a pricing problem and allocation problem or this problem and that problem. It is a single optimization problem called supply demand matching. Right? So what we did, we said, okay, let's throw all, our, all other metrics, right? You have profitability metrics, you know, you have all kinds of crazy metrics. I'm going to throw all of them out because there is a fundamental metric that you are all trying to solve in your own way. And that metric is this. Pricing is trying to solve this only. What it is doing, if the demand is high, what does pricing do? It increases the price. And when you increase the price, what happens? Demand artificially goes down and starts to match the supply, right? Similarly, when the, when the supply is high, what do you do? You lower the price and then the demand goes up and you're artificially matching supply demand, right? So essentially, you know, all problems are boiling down to supply demand matching problem, right? Pricing is just one example. So then we came up with this very simple formulation and we said, look, I'm going to now focus only on one metric, which is the efficiency of Ola. And we are going to say that, uh, you know, uh, how do we define efficiency right, of any system? See, operational systems like Ola, we need to define efficiency. So we said, look, it's very straightforward. First, you define what is the importance of a context? What is the value of a context? A location cross time. What is the value of it? Right? 9 a.m. near a mall, nobody is looking for a cab. The value of that location at that time is very low. Right? But 3 p.m. on a weekend near a mall, the value is very high. Same mall. Time is different. So K is the context, time cross location. And we said the value of that is very high compared to the other value. Right? So we started with that and we said there is a value of a time cross location. And at that time cross location K, if I look at supply demand gap, right? so I just look at the ratio of the minimum and the maximum. And if this number is 1, that means I'm on the line. Supply is equal to demand because this is 1 only when minimum is equal to maximum. Right? And if there is a gap, then I'm either losing money on the fulfillment side or I'm losing money on the utilization side. Right? So both are bad. And this is a very symmetrical metric. So both supply and demand has to match at all location scale, right? at all location and time grids. So that is our objective function. And then we said, look, let's measure it. And we came up with a number and we said, this number is what we are going to track. right? So day on day, week on week, whatever we do, Pricing team is not going to match its numbers and, you know, everybody is working on their own metrics is a wrong thing. So we said, here is a common metric. Let's all work on this common metric and try to improve. Right? And when I told this to all the people in the room, right? So, and I said, all of you are working on really on this one problem. They all completely agreed. And they said, yes, we agree. We work on it from our own perspective. Now we can work on it together. Yeah? So what I'll show you is this journey of how did we solve this problem? But the, the most important thing is this, right? I've already told you the most important thing I have to tell you, which is the art of data science is not about building models from data, but to formulate a good objective function to track. And then you work backwards and say, this is the metric. Therefore, these are the models, not one model, plural. These are the collection of models we need to build. Therefore, these are the features we need to create. Therefore, this is the data I need. What do we do now? We go from data to decisions. We need to work backwards and we need to say, what metrics are we doing? And therefore, you know, all the way to what data do I need to get there? Yeah. So, uh, so now what happens is, uh, all we need to now think about is, what is the value of a location time? What is the demand? How do you do demand forecasting? And how do you optimize supply? Right? And once you are able to do that, then you know we can uh, solve this problem in a very nice way. Yeah? So very simple, very complicated looking problem becomes a very simple problem at the end. Yeah? But now the boxes are complicated. Right? Okay. So now let's talk about the generalization. Right. So this is a this is what we call a two sided marketplace, which is resource constrained, and all such problems, whether it's cab cab ride or food delivery or grocery delivery, you know, you name it. Right. Ola, Uber, Swiggy, Zomato, you know, 5MGs, you know, all your, wherever resource is required, physical resource is required, and it is limited, and it can only be allocated to one order at a time. 
right whether it is uh, you know brick and mortar store for example uh, you know imagine that you have an inventory of a product again if the supply is high then demand or supply is low than demand there is a problem so a product in a retail environment is also a supply demand matching problem right because there is an inventory cost or there is a stock out cost right customer came in you you could not sell him the product because you don't have it is a bad as bad as you know uh, you know you have over supply of something and uh, you know you are not able to sell it both are a problem right so this is a very universal formulation supply demand matching and i'm giving you this as a as a uh, as a way of thinking that there are many many problem statements that can be mapped into this kind of a formulation okay and now we'll go through the the each box yeah all right so now let me talk about another important slide here which is how do i think about the ai architecture right is there a universal architecture of ai that i can use and i'm going to now show you that architecture and build that architecture for ola but you can generalize this architecture everywhere right? so um, you have signals right you have all the data coming in so if you look at all the data coming in ola you have customer apps everything that a customer does right you open the app you add money you give a feedback you book a ride you finish a ride you know you cancel a ride everything you do on the ola app is logged right then driver app right driver opens a app logs in logs out you know accepts a ride declines a ride all of that right uh does the otp entry whatever they do all the driver app right then you have data from third party from the internet and other sensors so you have a lot of data coming in right now data plays two roles the first role data plays is what we call the state thinking so one is signal thinking so we started with metric thinking right how do you formulate the big objective function what is the objective function in google search i want to maximize the click through rate on the top 3 results that is your objective function what is the objective function on netflix i want to maximize the recommendation and all that that right? engagement of my audience right uh, like that every product starts with an objective function right one only and then they track that so here we have defined the objective function then we go and now list all the signals now i go and say okay now i can go to my data science team and say tell me all the sources of data so they'll tell me these are the sources of data then i'll tell them what are the other sources of data that we don't have but are available online so the weather data is online the events data is online you know the the construction going on is online this the traffic data is online right so there's a lot of data that is available which is not your own so another learning that i'll share is don't just think of data as your own data that you collect but all the public data that is also available for you to use simultaneously that becomes your overall data pool okay? so that is your signal thinking then comes the state thinking the state thinking is unless you understand every entity in your business right what is a customer you know and we'll we'll look at some deep examples of that you know how do you understand a customer how do you understand a driver how do you understand demand patterns in a city how do you measure supply in a city right how do you understand the location in a city right how do you understand the events like cricket stadium events or whatever right and you know these are your state thinking models so we're going to see some examples of these models so what you do you take your data you convert it into state models and then you convert your states into actions so in every domain there are certain actions available to you right in ola world you can give incentives to customers offers to drivers you can ask drivers to move around you can convert a prime cab to a lower cab you can change the pricing on a cab uh, you can allocate a cab the way you want either to that customer or that customer you can route a cab this way or that way in the share ride right so you have a bunch of actions you have to list them down so you have to say what are my entities how can i define the states of those entities what are my actions possible how do i list all my actions then what do you do then you go back to your metrics and say what are my metrics right so we have defined a final metric if that metric is solved all these other metrics will be solved 
So there is always a single root cause metric compared to all the other metrics, right? So some of them are operational metrics like availability means when you open an app, do you see a cab at all or not? Right? Fulfillment, when you try to book it, do you actually get the booking or not? Right? Utilization, how long has the driver been active on the platform on a day versus in a ride? Right? Because if he's only 10% driving and rest of the time he's not driving, then the utilization is low. Customer cancellation, is it going up or down? Where is it going up? When is it going up or down? Right? Driver cancellation, your gross uh, monetary value, right? total revenue that you make, your ENTR, your total profit that you make after paying off all the drivers and salaries and everything, how much profit do you make? So these are all different kinds of metrics that businesses define. Right? And ultimately, they all boil down to one metric. How efficient is your operations? If your operations is efficient, you are going to have good metrics all over the place. Right? So these are all dependent metrics. That is the ultimate metric. Now, and then what do you do? You know, so you start with your data, you define your state, you change, take the actions, you, you wait for the environment, cancellations may happen, utilization may become low, you measure your metrics, and then you keep learning, right? So data science is not a one-time thing. You have to put a system in place. You don't have to build a model by hand once. You have to put a system in place so that the models are built every day, every hour, every week as needed automatically, right? So that's a platform that we need to think about, not the model that we built, yeah? Now, there is a very interesting thing here that the signals are used in two directions, right? One is on the state side and one is on the metric side. What does that mean? So if you look at your past data up till now and before, you use your past data to build the models and to, to build both the state models and action models. And then once the actions are taken, right, then you measure your metrics again using data coming after that. Right? So past data is used to build models. Future data is used to build uh, to quantify the metrics. Right? So that's why this arrow is on both sides. Yeah? All right. So we understand that this is the universal picture. You can apply this picture in every domain, every domain, whether it's agriculture, healthcare, telecom, retail, finance, everywhere you can apply the same picture. All you have to do is change the boxes inside and say the state, uh, you know, what do we measure state on will change, what kind of actions are available. So in agriculture, for example, ac actions would be, you know, giving the right advisory to the right farmer at the right time, right, uh, would be an action, for example, right doing the harvesting at the right time, doing the, uh, you know, uh, watering of the crop at the right time, right? Giving the right fertilizer at the right time. So all these are actions in agriculture. Similarly, actions in healthcare, actions in, you know, other domains, right? So we understand that metrics, again, every domain will have their own metrics, right? So these four things are critical and the learning is happening at both stages. One is, can I learn my state better? Right? Maybe I didn't model the customer correctly, or maybe I didn't give the offer correctly. So either my state is wrong, my understanding of the customer state or diverse state is wrong, or my actions were wrong. So either I improve my state models or action models. Right? So that's a learning is going into both the boxes. Yeah? So we understand now how data science is thought through in a top down. So this is a top down architecture of AI in any domain. Yeah? All right. So now let me give you some examples of state models and then we'll talk about some action models. So that will give you a bottom-up insight about how to think about this. So I said earlier, bottom-up and top-down thinking you will learn through this kind of a lecture. So let's start with one very interesting model. Right. So before I joined Ola, I worked there as a consultant for some time and I said, I don't want to join until I have figured out what I'm solving. Is it worth my time? And I realized it's an amazing problem to solve. And, but I wanted one more thing done, which was to understand whether the data has any interesting insights in it or not. So I asked the team to do a very simple exercise for me. And I said, uh, you know, we want to learn what we call point of interest, you know, which is a, a model like this. So basically we wanted to learn about the city, right? And this is a, 
the very now i am coming all the way to the other side the most simple model that we started with right so we want to know that in every city there are only so many types of locations these are called point of interest right so it's a movie theater or a stadium or it's a, a place of worship or it's a hospital now there are many sources of this data right you can get it from gis data map my india and all of that you can get it from, from google maps uh, if you can crawl them properly you can get it from user tax right a lot of people in ola will say this is my home this is my work and if you know this is home and work for many people that means these are apartments and these are office locations right so you can tell that um demand patterns is another way to figure that out right so we will talk about demand pattern and then the learning from here so all these yellow boxes are the learnings right so pay attention to the yellow boxes so what i learned here is that the input is not important in this model the input is not important why because gis data is one kind of an input user tags is one kind of an input demand patterns is one kind of an input they all have their strengths and weaknesses gis data may be very good and structured but it may be stale one year ago two years ago and it's very expensive right to renew the license and get it because th these companies spend a lot of time building that second user tags user tags are very reliable whenever they are available but they are not available for every customer not every customer puts it there right so you can trust gis data but only 70% it may be old and expensive you can trust user tags but only 60% right and you can you know therefore you need to think about all possible inputs so that the output is what you really care about right so when we say we are building a model we are really talking about the output not the input the input is up to your creativity right so you can always say if you want to know this why don't we just get it from map my india then you will uh, you know weigh the pros and cons then you say no we need another source how about this how about that and then you come up with a model right so there is not you know always think that there are multiple possible ways to solve the same problem and the different sources of data will have their different you know qualities that you can use right so that's an important learning so now let's talk about uh, this thing called demand pattern right so this is the third way to do it the first two are obvious uh, and remember the goal here is to do this i want to know which location in the city lat long in that neighborhood what kind of location it is why is that important i'll show you so we are going to build up a whole series of models and i want to show you the connection between them so then you will understand that uh, you know machine learning is not about building one model well it's about thinking about the entire architecture of models and doing all of them okay all right so here what we did we said okay how do we now so i gave a bunch of lat longs to my team when i said show me in your data the percentage of drops and the percentage of pickups in a day right on a weekday and these are different locations right but x axis is time 12 12 24 hours and then we looked at uh, these two types of location so in the left location we looked at you know the red is the same as this red and uh, what we are saying is the red you know the 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 drops are high in the evening and the pickups are high in the morning drops are high in the evening pickups are high in the morning so this is one type of locations and the other type of locations the you know drops are high in the morning and pickups are high in the evening opposite right and then you can guess now right so the left side is home home uh, apartments because this is where a lot of commuters right there you want to be picked up in the morning from home and you want to be dropped at home in the evening versus this is office locations and now you can see very clearly that the structure of demand patterns and using that you can tell a lot about a location right airports will have a different structure uh, hospitals will have a different structure schools will have a different structure places of worship will have a different structure on certain days it will increase and all that things like that right so so the idea is now we understand that this data has a lot of very interesting insights our job as data scientist is to ask the right questions 
to verify the right hypothesis and saying, you know, I believe that your data is able to tell you what kind of location it is. And if I know how to ask that question, then I can tell. So I took a bunch of known homes and known offices and gave them that. I did not tell them what it is. And when they saw this, they realized that their data is a lot more valuable than it looks like, right? And it can tell you even that. Okay? Just from Ola data, I can tell what the city looks like. Just imagine that. Okay. okay. So uh, now let's talk about another model, right? The ride intent model. So when I was at Microsoft, we built a very interesting thing called the query intent. See, when you come to Ola, uh, Google search or, or Bing search, you don't just do a search. You have an intent in mind, right? I want to order uh, pizza because, you know, it's a dinner intent. Or I'm looking for a movie because I want to go for a movie. There is an intent behind the query. Similarly, there is an intent behind the ride, right? So I wanted to understand the ride intents. Why do people travel? I, I'm not interested in how much money we made, how many people traveled, how many rides came, how many cancellation happened. Those are superficial questions. As a data scientist, the what question is not of interest to you. What happened is not interesting at all. What is interesting is why it happened, right? So why do people travel? We know why people travel, right? But we want to now uh, create a catalog of it and we want to assign that this ride is a commute to work ride. This ride is a commute to home ride. This ride is an airport drop ride, right? And how do we build that model? Again, it's a very simple thing. You'd look at the source type. Remember the point of interest type and all that and the destination type. And now you can also add day of week, time of day. And now you can start building these kind of models. Why are they important? Because imagine if you have two intents, one guy wants to go to a hospital, another guy wants to go to a movie and you have only one car cab available, right? You have one cab available, there are two requests. One has come to go to hospital, one has come to go to a movie. You are going to allocate the hospital right because that has a more uh, important intent, right? So very simple things like that you can do in your allocation if you know the right intent, right? I'm just giving one example. There are hundreds of examples like that, right? All right, so we understand that. Now, the, the real learning here is that I talked about this idea of an AI architecture. That means one model is not enough. You may learn how to build single models. You may learn how to do, you know, very nice uh, parameter sweeps and all of that on it. But one model is never enough. You have to start thinking about an architecture of model. Like we break down a big IT project into multiple microservices and connect the microservices together. Similarly, like there is an IT architecture of an organization, there is an AI architecture of an organization too, which is basically made up of all these hundreds of models. And these models are talking to each other, right? So here I'm showing you this because I want us to understand that these models, point of interest models, are feeding into uh, our right intent models, yeah? and so on and so forth. Right? So we understand that. So we are interested in building a, a model, uh, a system of, of uh, multiple models that can go together and feed into each other. Yeah? All right. So now let's talk about another very interesting model that we built, which is the value of a location. This is a very interesting project we did. Um, the patent is still in the works. Uh, so here the idea was, how do you quantify the goodness of a location cross time? What does that mean, right? So uh, we formulated it in a very interesting way. We said, look, Google has the web page graph, right? Web pages for us, the unit for Google is a web page and a query. For us, the unit is a location cross time and a ride, right? So in the Ola one. Then Google has something called a link graph, right? So the internet is connected, you know, one page is connecting to another page and all that. Similarly, Ola has a demand graph. So between location to other location, there is a demand graph. How many people go from this location to this location at any given time of day? So that is a demand graph that you can extract from all the Ola data. Right? And if Google can build something called a page rank, we wanted to build something like a context rank, which is saying, how good is this location time compared to that location time? 
or same location at a different time right so how do we think like that and uh, so we took uh, you know a leaf from page rank and converted it into a ola prompt so here's how we formulated this right and hopefully if you understand this you will understand that see so far i have not used any machine learning technique that we are used to right i am only doing first principles and i am just converting a business problem into a formulation and thinking about what are the inputs and outputs right all right so now uh how did we solve this problem right this is a very beautiful formulation and if you understand this uh, you know there is a deeper thing behind this formulation that i wanted to understand so let's talk about the most the biggest pain point when you ask an auto driver ki bhaiya wahan chaloge ki nahi and he says nahi i don't want to go there see i am willing to pay the guy but he is not willing to go there and what is his excuse he will say wahan se sawari nahi milta right i don't get a ride from there if i go there at this time i know i will be stuck there i will not get a ride from there this is the most common street wisdom in fleet management right how do we convert that into a mathematical formulation how do you convert a street wisdom into a mathematical formulation that is the beauty of this slide right so here what we did was we said look we need to define a notion of value how important how good is a value of this location at this time right x is the location t is the time and we want to define a number such that if a driver is at this location at this time what is the expected earning of the rest of the day that is what we wanted to capture so we want to define a location and time in such a way that we can say that if you are at this location at this time and probabilistically i am going to assign you a right and from there another right from there another right from there another right eventually how much money will you make that is the goodness of a location this is what is going on in the subconscious mind of a a cab driver yeah and we have to understand that before we can come up with a fancy model around it right so we said okay let's solve this problem so how did we solve it we said okay let's look at our demand graph right so we have a demand graph that tells me that if you are here at this location how many rides came for this location this location this location this location so how many you know rides came for different destinations right so we have an outgoing probability transition matrix right what is the probability of going here 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 and here uh, given that you are here at this location and time so these are adding up to 1 now let's look at a destination right this is the destination where you go to location y at time t prime and remember t to t prime is the time taken between going from location x to y right um, so you reach there in at time t prime now there is a value here also of this location and time right and the guy will say i will reach there in 30 minutes and i'm thinking nahi milta sawari that means the value is low So I don't want to go here because the value is low. That's how they are thinking. So we are capturing that in a in a machine learning system, right? So now what are we saying? We are saying that look, if you go from here to here, this is the current rights value. This is the money you will make now, right? So this is the function of the locations, which is the distance and the time of the day. Because if time of day is evening or morning peak, you are going to get more money for that right, right? So peak versus lean. so that takes care of the time time takes care of that right so what is the value of this ride plus plus what is the value of my earning for the rest of the day right so essentially that's what we want to capture right so then we came up with this equation and this is a very uh, beautiful equation which is related to the belman ford equation in in reinforcement learning so when you run reinforcement learning this is how they think about it right so we said that look this is the val total value that this location delivers to all the drivers if we are here right that's what this number means now that value which is realized by the future rides i have accumulated all that value into this node into this number and now i am percolating it backwards right so i am percolating the value backwards so i am saying how much of this value is going to this edge how much of this value is going to this edge 
So then we, we need to know what fraction of this value going to this edge. So this is that number. This number says that if I take the summation of those these incoming edges, what is the probability that you are coming to this location from x comma t? So that is what this is, right? What is the probability that you are coming to y comma t prime from location x, right? And that is that probability. So that fraction of, of this value is going to this edge. So remember, decisions are happening in the forward way. Value is, you know, distributed in the backward way. This is the fundamentals of, of uh, you know, how do we learn to play chess, for example, right? You don't know anything about the game in the beginning of the game. But as you get closer and closer uh, to the end, what happens? Your ability to determine whether I'm going to win or lose if I play this move or that move, your ability becomes sharper and sharper as you are closer to the end of the game. And at the last move, you know completely that you're going to lose or win, right? So you're most sure about the value of a board position towards the end. And then you start to percolate it backwards, backwards, backwards to learn how to play chess better, right? Because if I play this move now, eventually I will win the game is how we think about chess, right? So value percolates backwards, decisions happen forward, simple principle. So same thing here, right? So the rights are allocated forward from morning to evening, but at the end, your total earnings is there. And that's the most correct estimate of this number, but that estimate has to be percolated backwards, right? That's exactly what you do. So now we are saying this value is percolated backward this much. So plus this is the expected money you are going to make in the forward rights. Plus this is the money you are making in this right. And if I sum it up over all the Y's that you can possibly reach from here, that is the total value of this location, right? So we are percolating value backwards, right? So that is this equation. And now this equation gives us a clear indication of, uh, you know, how to make tactical versus strategic decisions, right? So, uh, so this is what gave us the ability to make long-term earnings decision of the driver. So we, we, you know, one of the goals of Ola and Uber is not to just serve the customer better, but also to distribute the money earned by the platform almost equally to all the drivers. Good drivers like make slightly more money than bad drivers in the rating system, but overall they want to distribute the money. So the only way to do it is to have both tactical and strategic thinking. What does that mean? It means pretty much like, you know, sometimes in the chess game, you lose a queen to win the game eventually, right? So your tactical moves looks very bad, but you win the game eventually. Same thing here. Uh, if I have a, if I have one driver who has not made enough money for the day, he's behind. Another driver who has already made enough money for the day, if I have two options in allocation, who should I allocate the next ride? Well, I'm going to look at two things. How much money will he make in the current ride if I allocate? Plus, what is his expected earning if from there? If the expected earning from there is very low, but this current ride is very high, that means his total is still very low, right? So now I can bring in both the current and the probabilistic future together into my objective function, right? So this becomes a new thing. And now they can make better decisions. And now suddenly the driver earnings, all the drivers started making good amount of money yeah, because of this one equation. See, this is how powerful these equations are. And if we learn the art of formulating them, we can completely transform businesses like fleet management. Yeah. So we realized that, you know, this is a picture of your favorite core Mangala area. And, uh, you know, uh, most of us are probably from there. So the idea is here in the morning, it looks very different. The values of each grid is very different than in the evening, right? And this tells you where your cap should be at in the morning versus evening. Yeah? Okay. All right. So we understand now, okay, value we understand now, uh, you know, now let's talk about demand. Right. So here is the demand thing. So we talked about value. Now we're talking about demand. Right. Another set of learnings. Demand forecasting is one of the most important problems in a two sided marketplace. Nobody cares about demand forecasting in Google search. Why? Because the supply of this 
this is infinite right they only care about you know my cloud infrastructure should run the number of queries coming per minute should be we should be able to handle and they are able to handle it through auto uh, scaling right but in case of resource constrained systems like ola uber like food uh, like uh, you know refineries like retail where the physical products are involved demand forecasting becomes a very important piece right so we'll talk about that and recently there was a talk given by satya nadella himself uh, where you know azure is building a whole suite of things on retail and he only talked about demand forecasting why is that such an important topic yeah so demand right how many cabs are needed of what category in this location in this time that is your demand forecasting problem yeah and you have a whole historical data to figure that right now as data scientists what do we do we just don't focus on the numbers how much we focus more on the cause and effect than on the numbers the causal models are more important to us than the total aggregates of the outcome so we're not here to just predict the demand we are here to also understand the why of the demand here yeah? so we said okay let's build our first demand forecasting model we we'll look at the point of interest which we built earlier ride intent right commute ride versus non commute ride uh, and all our historical data and we are going to come up with a organic uh, set of features and that will give us our version 1 of the demand forecasting model yeah so we have our version 1 and you know it gave certain accuracy and we are all happy with it but it only gave so much accuracy no matter what we did it was not improving after that right we tried lstm and this and that and everything failed after a point it just did not budge right so that is one thing you are if you are focused on only one set of features there is only so much you can do with it at that time you have to stop step back and think oh am i missing an, uh, another dimension to this problem right so then one happened one day uh, you know we were looking at our you know predicted demand on a wednesday and an actual demand on the wednesday so the predicted demand was showing something else and the actual demand was very different what was the actual demand that suddenly everybody wanted a rental cab in the middle of the day for the whole day on a wednesday and we said this never happened there is no demand forecasting model that is predicting this what's going on and we are in bangalore uh, this is the bangalore data so we are looking at it and saying what's going on and it turns out that day was a diva uh, not a diwali day it was a raksha bandhan day rakhi day and because of the holiday season the demand patterns were very different right all the brothers were taking their sisters out and you know th there was a rental cab uh, requirement for that now one of the key skills of the data scientist is to be keep an eye on the outliers keep an eye on the outliers because you have modeled the organic demand your model is not improving anymore there are outliers in your system right there are two things that cause a model to not work beyond a point one is you are not modeling for everything you are only modeling for commute rides it's not happening today wednesday you know raksha bandhan commute rides are not happening so your demand is off the charts right prediction is off the charts second why your model can be wrong is you are not looking at all the factors right so we looked at both things and we realized that oh shit we have not put things like whether it's a holiday or not so then we started adding calendar data so you know all the religions their holidays national holidays you know uh, a friday is a holiday is a different thing monday is a holiday has a different demand pattern to the airport ride intents change very drastically if friday is a holiday or thursday is a holiday and all that right you understand the pre covid days when people were taking holidays you know and going to work we are talking about that right once upon a time so it's that time frame and we were talking about this time right so what was happening we were not putting holidays into account we were not taking weather data into account right because when it is very hot instead of taking an auto people prefer a cab because there is ac in the cab right ac rides go up non ac rides are not going up right weather data if it starts raining people prefer a cab to a auto right so again weather matters holidays matter what else matter 
So then we started thinking, you know, we are going to build a version two now. Let's add everything else we have not thought about. So then somebody came up with, you know, what about events in the city, right? So if there are stadium events going on in the city, right? Cricket match going on, a new movie has released. Everybody's rushing to the movie theaters. Harry Potter movie has come or whatever, right? Uh, it's a different demand pattern altogether, right? So we see that in the data, we can forecast it and predict that. But if you don't take these things into account, these are one of things which are not statistically significant. Majority of the data is not about holidays or weather or events. It's the, the smaller blips where these insights are sitting. Not the average data, not the overall averages, but the smaller special cases, right? Uh, a Wednesday is a holiday and Thursday is a holiday, special cases. So we started focusing on all that. Then we also considered, are we running any campaigns? Because as a business, if you are incentivizing certain people uh, or certain types of rights, the demand goes up, right? So campaigns increases demand. Is the competitor running a campaign, right? If Uber is running a campaign, then Ola has to watch out for that and vice versa. If Ola is running a campaign, Uber has to watch out for that and adjust their demand models, right? Because if somebody else is running a campaign, your demand will go down. Right? So that's another thing that happened. And we put all of this together to come up with a demand forecast. Yeah? And that become a very interesting model. And over a period of time, we started improving our demand forecasting by adding more and more factors that can play a role in demand forecasting. Right? And that became a very interesting uh, exercise and a learning experience. So we started with organic demand, added holidays and weather. And over a period of time, the demand forecasting improved. Okay? So we understand demand forecasting. Then comes supply uh, understanding. Right? So here what we did was we said, OK, we are taking care of value. We have taken care of demand. Now let's talk about supply. So as an operations company, we have to know exactly where my cabs are, where they are going to be, right? I need to know exactly my spread of the assets in the whole city at all times. We should be aware of that, right? So we know that because we have a ping that comes from a driver app. So we know where every cab is, right? But to model the supply, we need to think about all the factors that can affect supply. So we said, look, if you want to build a bunch of supply models, you need to look at the current supply, the incoming supply, you know how many caps are coming into this location and time and how, when will they reach. Mixing algorithm, right? How many prime cars you have converted to something else, how you are allocating caps, right? How many logins, logouts will happen, how many drifts out will happen. The drivers will just drift away to another location or they will come from another location. The supply is changing. How are the cancellations happening in this location? Driver cancellation and customer cancellation, right? So we look at all these factors to come up with the supply estimate. Now, what is the learning here is that, again, input is not important. Output is important. What we are modeling is supply. I don't care how you model it. So we said, look, part of the supply will come from the live data. You know, the caps that are running now. Part of the supply will come from prediction models. Can I predict how many cancellations will happen? Logouts will happen in this location and time in the next 15 minutes. So a combination of predictions and observations is leading to supply estimation. Right? So we understand supply is a real time thing. It's a live system. So you cannot have a historical model doing prediction. You also have live data coming in, right? And how do you merge the two to come up with a good supply estimate for the next 15 minutes, next half an hour in the whole city? That's how complicated these models are. Yeah? So we understand supply and demand, and we have to be able to model supply and demand in very different ways. Yeah? All right, so now I'm going to switch gear, and I'll talk about another angle altogether, right? So we understand now operations part supply, demand, metrics, efficiency, all of that. Now let's talk about uh, customer centricity. This is the new thing. You're going to hear it from all your bosses every day. Oh, we are a customer centric company and all that. Now I want you to understand what this means from a data science perspective. Yeah, What does customer centricity mean really? So now let's think of customer as a state machine, right? So customer 
on a certain date has a certain relationship with the business. I like the business. I don't like the business, right? Ola is giving me good service. I like Ola. Tomorrow, Ola cab driver was, uh, you know, sleeping at three o'clock in the morning. I missed my airline flight, and I'm very mad at Ola, right? So, state of a customer is what kind of experiences we are giving, what kind of nudges we are giving. Are we giving him the right offers? Is he taking them or not? Is he ignoring my offers? What is it, right? And that keeps evolving. Customer is a dynamic entity, and we need to be able to understand the customer completely and all the time. Yeah. So that is your state transition that is happening. It's a function of what experiences you are giving him and what nudges you are giving him all the time. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here the the key questions are: How do we define the state of a customer? How do we define the you know uh, state of the driver? Right. what is their full potential right are they taking all the rights with us or only a few rights with us can we increase that through cross sell and up sell right what kind of experiences we are giving and how are they affecting the state of the customer uh, and uh, you know how are they reacting to those experiences right uh, and so on and so forth right so so we need to keep asking these customer centric questions all the time and keep tracking the customer journey through the business and saying is he a loyal customer is he a valuable customer is he a new customer he has the customer's behavior changed in the last 3 weeks or whatever right so how do we think about a customer in a very detailed manner is customer centric thinking yeah all right so now i'm going to show you uh, some very interesting examples of that now we have all heard of clustering and i'm going to give you my perspective on it from a applications perspective yeah all right so now um there are two broad philosophies in ai right one is that uh, what i call the first order of ignorance i know what i don't know right so if you are building a supervised learning model where you are saying this is the input data this is the output data build a classifier or a regression model that is what i call first order of ignorance i know that i have to build this model what i don't know is you know how to build it and all that so they, that is something i'll figure out but it's a supervised learning model it's a completely uninteresting part of data science right it is automated you don't have to do much right all the creativity here is in model selection and feature engineering and you know that part uh, you can do all day long but that's a good exercise to do the more interesting part of data science is the second order of ignorance which is i don't know what i don't know so in the customer world you have millions of customers you have absolutely no idea what is your customer base like you really need to understand your customer base every customer is unique can i group them in certain ways so that i can do different things with different groups of customers right i don't have to send prime ride coupons to all my customers that's a useless thing to do right so how do i do that how do i think about these things and this is where segmentation and clustering comes into play yeah so let's look at that and we created a whole framework called perspectives what are the different perspectives in which we can look at the customer and it gives you such beautiful insights uh, that one insight can completely transform the business and you can save crores of rupees that is the power of what data science can do right so now let's look at a very simple uh, framework that we created and you know this is again rooted very deeply in this philosophy that you cannot look at a customer in a single way like when you look at yourself from a health perspective you can think of yourself in many many ways right your sugar cardiac health your diabetic health your psychological health your mental health your emotional health right your uh, gastric health for example your kidney health so your immunity all these are different perspectives on health similarly in any business you can look at a customer in many many different perspectives so let's look at some of that right so one perspective on a customer is the value perspective how much revenue have you generated uh, for the business right what is the average revenue per ride what is the revenue per hour what is the revenue per kilometer right depending on shared right and others uh, you know things like that so what is the value of a customer to the business is one perspective 
So I am going to look at only those features, group them together, and do a clustering there. Another perspective could be, what kind of cabs do you take? Do you like prime cars or mini or autos or share ride? That is another perspective, category perspective. Right? Another could be sensitivity perspective. Do you get upset when the car is late because of ETA, or do you drop or cancel a ride because it is too expensive? Uh, you know uh, things like that, right? So the the idea is that um, you can now define different kinds of perspectives that way. Yeah? Sensitivity of a customer. Another one is operations, right? What kind of experience have you given to the customer? Some customers you have given very good experience, right? Whatever ETA you have promised, uh, the expected time of arrival of a cab is the same as the actual time of arrival of a cab, right? So ETA versus uh, ATA, right? So now let's talk about uh, you know these the, this operations as a perspective, right? What kind of experiences we have given? Then what kind of you know when do you take rights, right? Do you take rights on the weekdays or weekends, mornings or evenings? What is your behavior, right? Why do you take right? Do you use Ola for commute, for schools, for airports? Why do you use Ola mostly for, right? And what kind of feedback have you given in the past? Right? What kind of nudges have we given you and what kind of nudges you have taken right, and used? So that perspective. So the point of this slide is that there is no single way of looking at a customer. A customer is a multidimensional entity and you can create so many perspectives on a customer, group the right features together and then do segmentation in that feature space. Right? So that is the power of how we think about segmentation. See, every Tom, Dick and Harry can learn how to use k-means clustering. That is not a learning at all, right? It's like knowing how to write from a pencil. That is not what you do. The true skill is what to write. That is more important, right? So what clustering to do is where your formulation thinking will come. This will not come if you don't delve deep into your domain. If you don't talk to your product managers, your subject matter experts, you will never become a good data scientist. That's what I have learned, right? So I have dealt with many, many domains now. And I start from scratch. I say, I don't know anything about refineries. I will spend hours together talking about refineries, how they work, what do you measure, what is good, what is bad. I will, you know, I've not known anything about telecom before I joined Geo. I now know so much about telecom because I spend a lot of time with the domain experts. So spending time with domain experts, learning the domain will give you these insights that, oh, I could do segmentation in these five different ways, you see? So I'm trying to help you understand the role of domain knowledge along with the data science skills that you are acquiring, right? All right. So now let's, let's look at some of these and they are very insightful. So uh, before we go to the examples of, uh, of the segmentation, I'm going to talk about feature engineering. Right? Feature engineering is one of the very profound arts in data science. Here, what we do, we think about uh, how to extract all kinds of features. Right? Now, tens of thousands of features can be extracted if you have a way to do it systematically. So what do we do? We think about what quantity you are measuring, what kind of aggregations you are doing. Is it the last one week of number of rights completed? That's a feature for a customer or for a driver, right? And what context, right? Time of day, day of week, type of cab, all of that. So when you combine all these three things together, you get lots and lots of features, right? And that is the art of feature engineering. So I tell my data scientists to not worry about whether we need a feature or not. Don't think like that. If you can create it, and if you can give it a semantic meaning, just go ahead and create a feature compute it from the data, put it in your feature lake, and there are hundreds of models we are going to build later. Some model may need it, some model may not need it. Don't worry about that, right? So we create feature engineering bottom up because we can, right? So we have to be very exhaustive in how to create features, but we have to be very judicious in how we combine groups of features together, all the value features together, all behavior features together, all you know, right features together. And then we create different groups of features, each giving me a different perspective on the customer. Yeah? So let's look at two of those. 
All right. So this is a real example. Uh, you know, these numbers are very old. So, you know, uh, don't worry about them. But the idea is this, right? So here, what we did, we said, let's segment our customers into eight segments. Right? And uh, we are only going to use one perspective, ignore everything else. What is the perspective? We looked at every customer's last six months of their rights. We looked at their distribution. What percentage of those rights were in auto versus mini versus prime versus luxury versus share. So we have a distribution now, right? So for every one of the millions of customers, we have a distribution over categories. That's a very unique perspective on all customers. So we narrow down the feature space, but we do this on the entire customer base. And this is what we got, right? Then we sorted these clusters by the value per customer. So this is my most valuable customer segment. It has 12.5% of the customers are in this segment. Each customer generates an average of 1400 rupees revenue for Ola. Right? So this is our very important customer. What are we learning here? We are now interpreting the cluster centers. So this segment are mostly prime rights guys, right? And because they're all prime rights, 90% of them, they're all uh, using, uh, you know, spending a lot of money and they are the premium customer, right? They want a good car, right? They want a good standard car. They don't want a mini or something. And they don't want to share a ride with somebody. And they are not worried about price. They're not price conscious at all, right? They are quality conscious and whatever you want to call it, right? So they are prime customers, right? Now, they are very good customer. You want to make them happy all the time. They are your loyal and valuable customers, right? What about the second group? Look at the second group. These group of people, you know, they are 50% prime and 50% micro. And uh, sometimes they take this, sometimes they take that. And you can actually tell that whenever they are getting reimbursed, they can use prime. When they are not reimbursed, they use micro, right? So they are slightly, you know, they are very judicious when to use prime, when to use micro. But they are a different breed of customers, very different from the first segment. This is another segment. These guys use mini as their main ride vehicle, right? They don't go to prime often, very lightly, but mini is their primary thing. Right? Then the next group, they are more price conscious. They are either micro mini, but they are also okay with share. So they can take a share ride or a micro or a mini. They are the right level of price conscious customers, right? This group, they go after micro and mini, uh, you know, but they don't take a share. So they don't, they don't want to share a cab, but they are still price conscious. But they don't like to share a cab. This is a different group. This group, you know, is micro and share. They are more price conscious. Then another group is only share. 99% of their rights are only share. They're all share customers, right? And then one group is not share at all, but they're even more price cost conscious. So they use a lot of autos and mini, but they don't go to share. Right? And then there are guys who, who go to auto and micro, which is even more price conscious. And there are some people who only do autos. They don't even go to a cab. Extremely price conscious. Yeah. So you understand now? So now if I, so what I did when we found this, we presented this to the customer team. And they were so excited. They came up with so many ideas around how we can use this. And this is so powerful and wonderful. And, you know, we can do this. And I'm just talking about one out of hundreds of such perspectives we create for the same customer base, right? Now, what can you do with this? So just one example of converting this state into action. Remember state, this is the state of a customer. Which segment do you belong to in this week or in this month according to this perspective? That is the state of a customer. And now I have all the 100 cluster IDs that are telling me this is what the customer looks like in this month, this month, this month, right? It's a dynamic thing, right? So we understand that. So now, what can we do? So when we looked at now, now just focus on one campaign, right? Prime campaign, right? So we want to now increase my the, the prime rights in the city. So we want to send out coupons for prime rights. Who should we send out these coupons to? If I gave you this data, very simple, very simple. It's like five lines of code. 
this five lines of code has saved Ola crores of rupees. Just five lines of code. That is the power of data science, right? What we have done. So now they said, look, if I give those coupons, you know, randomly to random people versus if I use the same money marketing cost judiciously, I will be able to do much better, right? So, so if I send those coupons to the first segment, it's a complete waste of money, right? See, you have a customer who is already a prime user. If you are sending him a prime coupon, he may become slightly more loyal, right? If he's a new customer and he's a prime customer and we want to increase his loyalty, we may want to send him a prime coupon. So you have to have a purpose behind a campaign, right? And then you can say to which customer I want to design a campaign for. So campaign design is a very important theme. But today it is done in a very rule-based manner. It is not done in a data science manner in any industry. So we want to change that, right? So now we want to give them these customer segments and using other parameters, they can now design a campaign that says, I want to send prime coupons if a customer is in segment one and his age on the platform is less than three months old. So a new customer who is a prime customer is going to get my prime coupons. A regular prime customer is not going to get prime coupons because he is anyway a prime customer. I don't need to incentivize him to take a prime rent, right? What about the second custom, uh, cluster and the third cluster, right? So the second cluster is also prime, but 50% is micro and mini. So again, this is this might be useful. If I give him prime cost, uh, right, it might be useful. But this guy is very useful. The third segment and the fourth segment, right? You know, they, they can afford but they're not trying it out. And if they try it out once or twice, they like it, they may switch. So the ROI is high. So now we started sending more prime coupons to segment three and four, right? Uh, because they, they have a little bit of prime, but we can increase that, right? With these coupons and incentivize to convert more to prime, right? Now, what about the last segment? Look at this segment, auto. Will it be useful for me to send a prime coupon to an auto guy, the guy who only takes auto? He is extremely price conscious. He may use your coupon once and twice, but he will never convert to become a prime customer. Right? So, so that is that. So it's a waste of money to send that coupon to a customer who is not going to convert eventually. So you understand how campaign designing happens with data science behind it. Right? And that's where domain knowledge, customer understanding, customer centricity, and campaign optimization happens as a joint problem once you give them these insights. Yeah? All right. Another example I'll show you uh, on this, right? So this is a completely different perspective. Now what we did was we said forget about the right types. Let's look at days of week and the distribution of that. So you spent X amount of money per month on what days that money was distributed, right? So then we said, look on, you know, and then we segmented the customer based on that. What day of week was the probability of you using a ride from Ola, right? And then we found some very interesting segments. The, the first three segments are very interesting. There is one segment which is spending 1700 rupees per month on Ola. They are using Ola on every day of the week, every day, seven days. They need Ola, right? There is one, the second segment uses Ola only the on the weekdays, not on the weekend. So these are my commute customers. So if I want to keep these customers, what I want to make sure is I have a cab dedicated for them in the morning and in the evening. And, you know, uh, you know, their commute needs are taken care of, right? That's what they need for. And then I have another segment of customers who never use Ola in the weekdays, they only use it on weekends. Right? Now, what, what can I do to use this kind of uh, insights? So we can always say, look, uh, you know, if you want to run a weekend drive, right? And say, these are my weekend coupons, who should you give your weekend coupons to? You know, you don't have to give it to the first segment, they already use it, or to the third segment. But the second segment, if you pop up a weekend coupon for them and say, look, 
you know you i know you are a happy ola customer you use ola for commute all the time but how about you don't have to find a parking space when you go to a mall right we'll give you a you know a one way free ride and the other way you pay right and uh, that becomes your uh, incentive right now that incentive is very useful for weekend customers right like that campaign designing can happen now i want you to think if i combine this perspective and the previous perspective together what will happen right so you could be a prime customer segment 1 in this perspective and a weekend customer in this segment uh, in this perspective right how do i look at the combination and come up with a new descriptor of a customer and say oh this guy is a prime weekend customer or a prime commute customer right or a auto weekend customer right so we can now group customers in a very different way. and these segments are very meaningful yeah so we understand the power of segmentation okay now let's talk a little bit about action models right so now uh, let me see uh, how are we doing on time uh, let's see uh, yeah we have half the people left a lot of questions good okay uh, so now let's talk a little bit about this campaign right so uh, there is a very interesting insight here so the idea is when you are building a recommendation for the right campaign for the right driver or for the right customer we break the problem into multiple sub problems we say is this campaign redundant he is already a prime customer should i be sending him a prime coupon or not redundancy relevant right he is an auto customer do i need to send him a prime coupon because it will not be relevant right roi if i do send him will it affect change in his behavior or he will just use the coupon go back to his old behavior so we think about breaking the problem into sub problems and then we build a model this is what i call latent modeling you never build a direct model you always break down the model into sub models and you build the sub models first then you combine them right very simple example in the credit world if a bank wants to give you a loan they are going to think about multiple things one is is your credit score high or not second is your capacity score high or not do you have enough money do you have enough salary and all that third they are going to look at your financial discipline how many reminders do you need to pay your credit cards all this data is now available in your smss there are at least 100 startups in india who are only doing this they are looking at the sms data building a credit model some are doing it for farmers some are doing it for sme businesses but they are doing it for uh, all of us and you know all your gpays and all your uh, bank apps they are monitoring our uh, smss and building credit models on us right and uh, you know so so they are not building one direct final model they are building multiple models so this idea of don't think of building a single model but think of breaking your problem into sub problems okay <coughs> anyway so i'm i'm just going to skip this part uh, this is another very interesting project that we worked on um, and this is about supply reshaping right so how do we think about how to move the cabs around in a city right so you know this was a very interesting debate i had with the with the you know cxos there and the idea was that uber had launched a very interesting visualization for their drivers so in their driver app uber was now showing what was the areas that were red where the pricing surge is high what were the areas which are low where the pricing surge is low right and what it did was it made sure that the drivers who are nearby so if i'm here 1.1 i will move to 2.7 because it is nearby and i am going to get 2.7 times the money instead of 1.1 times the money right why should i pick a right from here if here the surge is higher so that was the idea and uber decided to show all information to all drivers what does that do so we we thought about this for half a second and i was the only person in the room who said this is a very bad idea just because uber did it doesn't mean we should do it and this is a bad idea for the following reason just apply some basic common sense right what will happen if every driver in the city sees this they will all move towards the high area anybody who is in the neighborhood will move towards the three area 
what will happen as soon as they move towards three the supply will go up the demand is high supply will go up what will happen the price will come down good for the customer but to the driver you had promised 3x but by the time hundreds of drivers have converged here now the supply is more than demand and the prices have come down because pricing engine is a independent engine which works on supply demand ba balance and then suddenly there is complete chaos right so one of the great learnings from this was we did an experiment we found this behavior and we closed this experiment we said this is easy to do let's do it in one city figure it out and if we find it useful we'll do we had a hypothesis that this is going to create a chaotic situation drivers will move around like crazy in the peak time they will not be picking customer from where they are they are running around empty cabs towards a high peak region when they reach there they are not the peak is gone so all this effort of driving around empty cabs in a peak hour is wasteful and we saw that right so too much knowledge is not good so then we came up with an alternate approach we said what if you can pick and choose the driver you want to send to a particular location you don't have to show all information to all drivers but can you pick and choose the right drivers and send them to the right location so you take decision in your hands never show an insight to a grounds operations person and let him make a decision because he is making a decision from a personal objective function perspective and saying my rides will become 3x but he is not thinking that everybody is also thinking the same thing so the overall objective comes down because individual objectives start to matter so we said let's do it differently so this is a very interesting formulation so what we did here was we looked at the city in every 15 minutes and we grouped them by oversupplied versus undersupplied right so we said these o areas are oversupplied so the sup, you know supply is high demand is less right and these red areas are undersupplied right supply is low demand is high they are undersupplied and we said that the real problem we need to solve is how many cabs do you want to send from a oversupplied area to a nearby undersupplied area and to which one so we said our objective function the variables we are trying to optimize are these number of cabs how many cabs should i send from o1 to u2 is one number two number three number like that right so these are the numbers we want to calculate and imagine if this is done every 15 minutes or maybe ahead of time in 15 minutes then we can optimize supply equal to demand again we are doing the same problem supply equal to demand through pricing through this through that everywhere we are doing the same thing so we formulated it in a very simple interesting way we said look all we need to know is from a oversupplied area if you look at the difference between supply and demand right the difference between s and d that is your oversupply how much oversupply you have and this is your delta st this is the oversupply you have and this number minus how many cabs are you sending away from this area is the total number of outgoing numbers right and then you want to minimize that basically we want the delta of this to be equal to the sum of the outgoing and the opposite here right so here we have the opposite which is we want to increase supply in under supplied areas so we first look at the delta gap between you know demand and supply so here demand minus supply is the amount of under supply and we are saying the total number of incoming rides should be equal to the delta between demand and supply right so that is this number and we multiply that with the value of the location the first value we calculated right the value of this the value of that and then we also have to incorporate the eta right because if a cab is going from o to u there is a petrol uh, you know and time wastage and distance calculation so that is your uh, eta cost right how much how long will it take for a driver to go from here to here and we want to minimize this overall summation right and that will give us an optimal value of n the vector the matrix that is oversupplied to undersupplied and how many cars should go from here to here now once you know how many cars now you can pick and choose the cars right and you can say hey you are waiting for a long time you should move there and we just send that information to that driver not all information to all drivers 
that is a critical thing in how we build operational systems right so we understand that this is a beautiful optimization problem so you know whenever people ask me what is the skill you are looking for in a data scientist so far i have only used one technique called uh, clustering and i have used a couple of machine learning models in the beginning but but slide after slide i am showing you formulations of common sense thinking into mathematical equations combined with domain knowledge right common sense thinking domain knowledge formulated at math problems whether it's optimization problems or modeling problems or clustering problems right that is the kind of skill we are looking for this is the skill that is missing we are so much enamored by how to do k means clustering that we don't know how to think about using k means clustering for a business problem right is it even a clustering problem or not we don't know right so how do we go from being a tool centric data scientist to a domain centric data scientist is the challenge right and how do we think about domain holistically and formulate our business problems into these very beautiful objective functions right after this if you know how to code this in python java whatever you can give it to any system they will do it your job is done right so that, that is how uh, that is the kind of skill we are looking for right? another very interesting transition happened at ola when we did this uh, which is this eta model right so engineers at ola had coded up a very simple common sensical system that if a person is looking for a ride in location y and if there is no cab available in this grid where should the cab come from so in their simple minded thinking of an it person they thought that the cab can come from anywhere nearby right and obviously they are computing road distance not a physical distance and uh, you know they are just saying let's widen the circle if cabs are available here i will pick a random cab and it will come here uh, anywhere from anywhere if it is not available then i'll widen the circle widen the circle and i keep widening the circle so that's how they implemented because they have to do this in a very quick way this is what is an it solution to a problem they are not data scientist they are it people this is how they think this is a very good solution from an it perspective now how does a data scientist think about this problem right we said look you are doing supply demand gap minimization that's your objective function right so now imagine i have color coded the grid by demand minus supply right so the red areas are high demand areas and low supply areas and green areas are high supply areas low demand areas so the gap is positive or negative now if a cab is requested at location i out of all these corner grids not every grid is equally good they are equally distant but they are not equally good so i would rather pick a cab from a green area as opposed to a red area right the probability of sending a cab from green area is very high from a light green area is lower and from a light red area is even lower but from a dark red area it's zero right so this completely transformed the supply demand behavior patterns in the city why because now we are more intelligent in where the cab should come from it should only come from potentially oversupplied areas not oversupplied now but in the next 15 minutes also they are oversupplied right and then what we can do now we can cascade this effect so if i have sent enough cabs here and now i know that in the future this will become undersupplied i will start sending cabs here so it becomes a continuous system right cabs are getting distributed through our movement system and allocated through this system together these two systems are working only to solve the same problem supply equal to demand all the time right so that's a very simple transformation and now uh, you know more cabs are available to more people because uh, you are judiciously supplying cabs right allocation model we talked about this in uh, in one of my talks in the public domain so i don't need to spend a lot of time on this so the idea here is that imagine that you have so many types of signals features you have created right customer features partner features customer cross partner features and all that and now you are weighing them differently this is your policy to come up with a allocation matrix so every 1 minute or 5 minutes 
there is this algorithm that runs in every location in in every city which basically says how do i allocate this cab to this demand and what is the goodness of it if the eta is very large this uh, this weight is low if the driver is a good driver and a customer is a good customer then there is a good match and we should send him a good uh, driver to a good customer right all that so these are my allocation matrix and then there is a very simple computer science algorithm to solve this problem it's called a hungarian algorithm which will basically remove all the edges that are low weights and do proper allocation and then using that policy we will learn the matrix of the day right so we are making millions of these decisions every, every day in every city using a policy how good is the policy is measured only at the end of the day when we get all the metrics now the question is this policy led to these metrics in this city on a weekday on a weekend on a holiday whatever right in some context how do you learn this as a relationship because this is a very complicated relationship it cannot be learned it can be simulated it can be uh, simulated from the past data so what we did was then we built a or we plan to build a very interesting model called causality model we said look let's look at the policy matrix for the last 6 months every day every city we have a different policy and then i got different metrics at the end of the day and now this is our causality model what control variables led to what metrics and then can i use this causality model to do the reverse thing which says you know if the ola ceo wants you know profitability to go up versus customer cancellations to go down versus uh, you know uh, revenue of drivers to go up whatever metrics you choose accordingly the system should be able to figure out what parameters to use this is a very ambitious project in every operations company now we are doing the same thing in in refineries in in telecom also what control variables lead to what metrics is causality forward pass observed therefore if i need certain metrics what should be my control variables is optimization these are two things we need to solve together we need to understand causality then we need to solve optimization and that is a complete data science solution yeah all right so uh, so that was the idea and now you know uh, it gave us very interesting allocation and all of that um the last example i'll share with you is the share matching right so how does share work so imagine you have current rights this right has two customer this has two customers and all that one customer so these are existing share rights and these are the new requests that have come right somebody says i need a cab i need a cab i need a share request and they tell you where they are going you also know where these people are going how do we model this as an optimization problem so what do we do we build a uh, we build a edge weight again and we say look if i allocate this customer to this shared ride what would be my metrics right so we'll say look you know your detour will increase your eta will change you know you will have to turn around send the cab back pick up the guy then go forward you know the, these two guys are going east he wants to go west it's a bad allocation and all that so then we come up with a allocation relationship between a new request and an existing ride and again we solve a network problem called a click finding problem and we are, because a cab can only take three customers at most we convert this graph into a very gigantic click uh, clicks of three where you know one click could be uh, an existing ride and a new customer or all three can be a new ride all together we create a new ca shared cab and allocate it to all three people they are all going in the same direction they are all requesting the cab around the same time so club them together and it will be a good ride right so like that we will solve imagine solving this at a city level every 5 minutes so the 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 you know why ola is such a beautiful complex problem it has very beautiful optimization problems they are all to be solved in real time and at a city scale right and that is what makes it a very beautiful engineering and data science kind of a you know challenge for everybody to work on so i learned a lot from my ola days so this is one of my favorite talks to give 
about sharing all this knowledge with with you guys right so just to summarize you know uh, complexity of fleet management is huge we use every tool in our repertoire right uh, you know all the way from time series models to reinforcement learning to simulations forecasting and clustering and all of that uh, another thing is we don't build one model we build a hierarchy of models that interact with each other and uh, you know these models have to be thought through there is an architecture to it um, then there is a state thinking action thinking and how does that come together and there are trade off certain things you do manually certain things you can automate and all of that right so there is a very interesting uh, you know set of learnings from from